This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, so my name is Jason Londo and I'm a research geneticist with the USDA ARS and I study grapevine genetics. And in January, I'll be switching over to Cornell University as an associate professor in fruit physiology. And the point of that position will be to study how fruit crops adapt to climate change. So today I'd like to share with you a little bit of our experimental vineyard here on the McCarthy Farm in Geneva, New York, where I, I'm not a classical breeder. I don't breed for cultivar release, but I use breeding techniques to try to gain information on important traits in grapevine. And so what you see here, uh, so if you see through the hedges here, is our experimental research vineyard. And you're looking at a genetic mapping population that I uh, created by combining two wild species, Vitus riparia and Vitus rupestris. The two species are really important for grapevine rootstocks, uh, but they don't get used so much for scion breeding uh, due to their lack of really good fruit quality. What you're looking at here in, with every individual is a half sibling. And so it's all from the same mapping population, but they're all related. If you come in and look close, okay. so what you're looking at here in this particular individual, this is a female vine, and you can tell because you can see all the developing fruit forming on here. Uh, wild grapevine species are either male or female. Uh, each vine is either male or female. And in this case, this is a female. And you compare that to a male vine, which you can see over here. You can see here's the same flower cluster, but now all the flowers have fallen off and you can see there's no developing berries. This is one of the easy tools that you can use when you use wild grapevines because it's, you collect pollen from one vine and you supply it to the female vine to make the cross. If you use a hermaphroditic vine, like a cultivated variety, you have to go into each flower and dissect out the male parts so that you can make the cross. So you might be wondering why you would make a cross between two wild species if you don't really like to eat the fruit. And the reason I made the cross was to try to learn about stressful adaptations, adaptations to the soil, adaptations to the climate that are held within the wild grapevine species that are missing from cultivated grapevine. And the innovative thing about using this mapping population is we've taken all the plants here, all the, the half siblings, and we've cloned them and placed them on this side of the vineyard where we've mechanically grafted a cultivated variety on top of the roots of the vines behind me. When we do that, we can see what effect the roots have on the shoot phenotype. So we can measure things like leaf nutrition, fruit berry quality, growth habit, water use, all of that as the roots are controlling it. So what we're looking at here is down on this portion, this is the root stock. This is the mapping family individuals from the vines behind. Here's the graft union where you see this bulge. And this part of the vine is the cultivated variety mark which we've mechanically grafted on top. And so the root and the shoot communicate to one another through this union. And we're trying to understand if we change out the genetics of the root, how much of the shoot can we change? So one of the other approaches that I use uh, with breeding wild species is try to get an understanding of how different species react to changing climate. In particular, how early spring warming and then freezes affect grapevines. And so what we have here on this side of the uh, trellis is a cross between two wild species, Vitus cinerea from down around Texas and Vitus riparia from up in South Dakota. If we look over on this side, we have the same Vitus scenario from Texas, but this time crossed with a species from China called Vitus amurensis. Both amurensis and riparia are very cold hardy, but wake up very early in the spring. And scenaria is very cold hardy, but has very late bud break. And you can see some of the effects of that difference in timing when you look at these two mapping families. If I grab a cluster, here you can see that this cross has already flowered. All the flowers are off and the little berries are forming. But this cross, which is a half sibling, you can see none of the flowers have opened yet. And so in each of these crosses, the parents are producing very different flowering phenotypes. And that is because it's affecting all of the life cycles in the grape. This one, all the flowers are closed, whereas this one, they're all open and done already. And it would be tricky if you didn't know 
what to look for, yeah. but you can see that the little berries are forming there. And the thing that's interesting about these two comparisons is they both have the same mother. They have two different species fathers, but the same mother. And you get very different growth and development out of the two crosses. Well, some of the traits that we look at when we're trying to understand climate impacts on grapevine aren't very easy to see because it's what is going on internally inside the leaves and the vines themselves. And so what we do is we normally measure things like how efficient do the leaves take up carbon dioxide, how much photosynthesis are they doing given certain light conditions, and then what sort of ratio to carbon intake and water loss happens at the leaf level. And I don't have the equipment out here to show you, but we basically clamp things onto the leaves and then measure how the leaf is breathing within different chambers and get an idea of how the whole vine is responding to given treatments. Look at that leaf morphology with these really deep sinuses and the teeth. It's so very different from a lot of you can see here. This is a more normal looking grapevine leaf. There's just so much diversity between species and between the way that sorting goes. This is a cross between two wild species. One species is Vitus estabalis, which grows along the eastern seaboard, and Vitus riparia, which grows along the eastern seaboard, but also all the way up into Canada and out to the Great Plains. These two, <laughs> these two vines are siblings from the same cross. And you can see very different growth morphology. Look, look at the size of these leaves are enormous and you get this dark um, purple cane material that's very akin to Vitus estabalis, one parent. And then you have this vine which has got this much more rusty sort of yellow tinged leaves, uh, much smaller, not so much vigor. That's a lot more like the riparia parent, the other parent in the cross. And so here just between these two individuals you see those two genetic backgrounds diverging. And so their siblings, just like what we were looking at before, these two are brother, sister, brother, brother, sister, sister, whatever you want to call it. Um, but they're segregating for that leaf, that compound leaf trait. But the concept behind it is if you have a really hot, sunny day and you have really big, flat leaves, you know, something like that, and a really dense canopy, it absorbs a lot of heat and there's not a lot of airflow. And so if you could make a cross so your canopy was open and airy, then you'd have more dappled light getting into the, into the berry region and you'd have more airflow for sprayers, for natural wind movement. And so it's a concept where we don't really know if it would be widely adopted but we're trying to figure out how to modify the entire canopy through just a few genes. And in this case, it, we know where the gene that is doing this phenotype, making this compound leaf, we know where it is in the genome. And so that's the concept behind this bit of breeding. <laughs> try to figure out how to open up the canopy naturally. So one of the questions we have is if you were to compare two canopies, one made up of the simple leaf and one of the compound leaf, does the compound leaf canopy cool faster? As you can see here, even in the wind, with these compound leaves, there's a lot more airflow through that leaf surface. You have smaller boundary areas, so you should be able to you know, breathe better. And so we need to ask the question is, do leaves that are shaped like this cool faster than leaves that are shaped like this? And also, if you compare the surface area of the two is the little bit of leaf surface area that you're losing in the compound leaf, does that have an effect on the overall uh, efficiency of photosynthesis in the vine? As, as things get hotter and muggier, um, you, need, you need good airflow uh, for the health of the inside of the canopy. And, and it might be that this compound leaf variety is the way to go. As an aside, we're also, <laughs> I think this would make like a really good ornamental. Another thing that this one has is it has purple. So this is, comes from a cultivar called purpurea. And so the trait for this leaf red color is in that background. Now this is the simple one. So that doesn't, it's not in the right background yet. But imagine if you could put the purple in with the compound 
then you could then you could really start getting some interesting ornamentals. And you can layer things, right? And you can layer in maybe some variegation. So if you had white streaked through there, so you'd have pink and white and green and yellow, you know, all sort of layered. Ready? Yes. So what we're, we'll wait for the semi. <laughs> This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.